Thank you for this opportunity to talk about uh, a very sensitive issue, but a very important one. And I'm so glad for those who organized the study to allow this to be a part of it. Um, I, I believe that as preachers, we ought to be studying theology and doctrine, but part of that study ought to be how to apply and how to use this doctrine in the real world. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. The Bible has a mandate to defend the helpless from cover to cover. The scriptures show us that those who cannot defend themselves need to be protected by those who are able to. If you haven't already had the chance, this is our study outline. That's a QR code. And if you know how they work, you could take it. It gives you access to a sermon folder where you could find this PowerPoint and follow along slide by slide if you want to or for later use. As I began to study this, I felt a strong sense of uh, mem remembrance to when Marissa and I were renovating a house. And we decided to uh, put new tile in the bathroom. And so we pulled up the linoleum floor and it was kind of shaky. And uh, the wood was creaking in such a way that wood ought not creak. And so then we pulled up the subfloor and we looked at the pier and beam and it was creaky or creaky and cracky. And uh, there I was down in the mud and Marissa walked around the corner. She thought I was just pulling up linoleum and I was standing on the dirt underneath the house looking up at her going, sorry, honey. This is our life now. And that silly example is uh, how I would like to express uh, preparing for this study where you pull back one layer and you pull back another layer and the farther that you go, the uglier it gets. And yet uh, we find that we need to talk about it. Now, the Bible says in Ecclesiastes 1 verse 9, there is nothing new under the sun. And so I want you to know as we begin that this is not a new issue. And when we study sin, uh, especially sins that maybe we're not familiar with, when we, we have maybe a, a, an immediate reaction of, how could this be happening? Well, we need to take a collective breath and know that, one, there have always been those who have had power, and there's always been those who haven't had power. And that dynamic, unfortunately, means that there have always been those who abuse power, and there are those who have been abused by that power. In the United States today, uh, we live in a time when everybody has the ability to cry out. And so sometimes it's difficult to know when someone's crying out, is this a legitimate issue or are they seeking attention? And so we might conclude that I'm confused, I'm defeated, I'm just going to throw my hands up in despair. But I need you to know, as we begin to talk about this mandate of defending the helpless, that the Bible does speak, that God is not silent, and that amidst a plethora of cries in, on social media, there are legitimate issues. And so we want to begin with clear Bible teaching about the oppression that people go through and those who are helpless. Psalm 82, verse 3, Give justice to the weak and the fatherless, maintain the right of the afflicted and the destitute, Rescue the weak and the needy, deliver them from the hand of the wicked. So some of these are encouragements towards people who are doing what's right to continue to do what's right. But what we'll find through the, the history of the Old Testament is that God's people would get comfortable. And when God's people got comfortable, all sorts of vices would begin. And typically it would begin with the corruption of the prophet, the priest, and the king. And by the, the corrupt power, uh, when they would begin to overlook those who were unable to defend themselves, prophets were sent to cry out against this oppression. And they would say things like in Isaiah 1.17, learn to do good, seek justice, correct oppression, bring justice to the fatherless, plead the widow's cause. In the New Testament, we find that this, uh, this cry for justice continues. James 1.27, religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and keep oneself unstained from the world. Now, I've just showed you three scriptures. I got a stack of papers over here and each packet is 30 pages long. It probably represents two or three hours worth of a discussion. I, can, I don't have that much time tonight. So if you want to hear more scriptures, get one of these packets and read through it and know 
that there is a strong pattern of scriptures from beginning to end that support this biblical claim. Here's the clear connection. God cares about the oppressed. God is not deaf to their needs. God expects His people to advocate for those who cannot advocate for themselves. And when justice is lacking, God will see and God will hold those who are accountable. Now, we're talking specifically about this oppression. And, I mean, again, uh, you could go a lot of different directions. But the way that I talked about it with Alan and, uh, and some of the things that I've been involved in is specifically in the context of abuse. So we're talking about some facts and statistics about abuse. Well, I think it's important to ask a lot of questions. I will ask a lot in the presentation on your behalf. And uh, this question is, who are the helpless? Who are the oppressed? And we're going to identify them as people who are unable to protect themselves from physical, emotional, sexual abuse, and neglect. And this includes minors. In our country, that's going to be people under the age of 18. Elderly, those who, uh, they're not necessarily an age associated with this, but people who require everyday activities such as feeding, changing, bathing. People who are mentally incompetent of making decisions on their own. And it can be female and it can be male. Yes, men can be abused. And yes, statistically speaking, women are far more likely to be abused. But nobody has uh, a claim to saying their gender is the one that is the only one that's abused. Well, what are we saying when we talk about abuse? Our federal government defines it in very specific ways, what physical abuse and sexual abuse and emotional abuse and neglect is. And I want you to know, even though this is not a study about spanking, that spanking is not physical abuse. I feel like I need to say that because as we talk about abuse, there will be those that think that's what I'm inferring. I spanked my kids. I still, I guess, could technically. They haven't done anything lately worthy of a spank. I was spanked when I was a kid, and I hope that my kids, when they grow up, spank their kids. I have a lot of information about spanking in there, but that's not my topic tonight. What I do want you to know is that one in seven children in our country faced abuse or neglect in this past calendar year to an estimated cost of $592 billion. Imagine if we could erase abuse from our country not only would we knock out the national debt in a generation, but all of the positive residual benefits that would come from people who didn't have uh, what would eventually become a weight on the taxpayer. Now, I'm going to take, as Nathan did, a specific angle towards sexual abuse. That doesn't mean that it's more abusive than simple physical abuse or emotional abuse or neglect. They are all evil and wrong. But because there is something insidious and sometimes often shameful about sexual abuse that the others do not carry, uh, this one's oftentimes the most difficult to talk about. But just like a wound that runs deep, that may be infected, and that we covered it with a band-aid for far too long, what I would like to do is rip that band-aid off and have an honest discussion in the context of sexual abuse and how we have to defend the helpless. Now the Bible, excuse me, so easy to say that. The Bible says, statistics say one in three and one in six, that is girls and boys, will be raped, assaulted, or molested before the age of 18. That's a staggering number. And I can tell you, I was a PE coach for two years, many moons ago at an elementary school. And in the state of Texas, we had to do abstinence training. Believe it or not, in the state of Texas, we had to do abstinence training and the PE coach with the fifth graders was the one that talked about abstinence. So I had to have these conversations. And this data from now is the same as it was 10 years ago whenever I was giving those presentations. And looking out in a, a gym with 100 kids doing the math is just a nauseating feeling. When you see, it is highly likely that there are those that are here who are being oppressed. But even more nauseating than that number is the fact that only 3% three of, the, of these cases will ever reach criminal conviction. That's a tragedy. It is an absolute tragedy. Let's talk briefly about the victim survivor, Victor. And I think I'd like to share with you who are present and then also those on YouTube who are watching at a later time. I'm going to do my best, if you have been abused, to not conjure up painful or traumatic experiences it is important that we try to uh, 
uh, help those that have not been through this to at least try to walk a little bit in your shoes. And so bear with me if I don't get that balance right. We'll divide this up into two sections uh, for the sake of time. We'll talk about opening our eyes and then how mindset matters. Now, Dr. Anna Salter, as was quoted this morning, Nathan in my study, by the way, if, if, if you were here, you'll understand that there will be some overlap. If you weren't here and this is brand new, I'm going to present the information like it's brand new and nobody heard it. Dr. Anna Salter wrote a book about predators and, and interviewed uh, several hundreds, if not over a thousand different predators. And uh, she defines or, or describes sex abuse using this metaphor. Child sex abuse is like being bitten by a rattlesnake. Some kids recover completely and others don't, but it's not good for anyone. Dr. Cloud and Townsend from a, a really good book called Boundaries, and I encourage everybody to read that if they have time, uses the metaphor of skin, saying that skin is the most basic boundary of all, but victims of sexual abuse are fed a lie that their boundary line does not really begin with their skin and others get to invade their boundary whenever they want to. And yet another metaphor that's commonly used is that your body is like a tree and a tree requires nutrients, requires sun, requires water, but sexual trauma is like a lightning strike. The effects of trauma on the brain include flashbacks, somatic or nervous responses, emotional numbing, disassociation, chronic depression, anxiety, acute medical conditions and compulsive behaviors including sexual dysfunction, excessive or hypersexualization, substance abuse, self-mutilation, eating disorders, and suicidal ideation. In all cases of sex abuse, the offender has some sort of power, as we've talked about, over the victim. And it could be age, it could be strength, it could be money, it could be guilt, it could be intimidation, it could be shame. But this type of abuse has one thing in common, and that is some a person is greatly affected by what's been done to them. Does the Bible ever talk about this? You know, are we talking about things, is, is the therapist talking about things in a therapeutic way but not biblically? Well, the Bible does speak about sexual abuse and it doesn't hide the fact. In Genesis 34, Dinah is abducted and raped by Shechem. In Judges 19, the Levite's concubine is viciously raped and murdered by a gang of men. In Genesis Nineteen two men who are visiting are attempted to be raped by the residents of that town. And what we're going to show uh, is just simply a, a reaction verse of the tragedy of Tamar in 2 Samuel chapter 13, verse 19. Uh, Tamar was incestuously raped by her half-brother Amnon. And after being violated, it says, Tamar put ashes on her head and tore the long robe that she wore, and she laid her hand on her head and went away crying aloud as she went. Her father, the king, did not administer justice. She had to live the rest of her life as a desolate woman. We happen to have just read this in family Bible reading. It's really fun isn't the right word to say of reading this with a 10-year-old girl, but my daughter Penelope, when reading this story and talking about the injustice of her life, we closed our Bibles at the end and she looked at me and just said, is that it? A 10-year-old gets it. Tamar's tragic example reminds us that there is nothing new under the sun, and like a tree struck by lightning, her life was forever changed. But I think we also need to ask the question, are abuse victims forever broken? Because that might be the narrative that you're getting so far, is that this tragedy is one that's insurmountable and not overcomable. And yet, there's a lot of literature that talks about this idea of moving from a victim to a survivor towards a victor mindset, as this book would reference, as another book would reference, it describes the victim as one who struggles to cope, the survivor as one who's learned how to cope, and the victor as one who's completely broke free from the prison of hate, fear, shame, guilt that has enslaved her. And this is a Bible-based concept. Romans 8.37 says, no, in all things we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. And research corroborates this information. Uh, you can check the sources for this if you'd like to, but mental health of those who relinquish themselves to a victim mind state for the rest of their life, meaning every single decision that they make is based off of uh, this encounter by which they were a victim. And I'm not talking about sexual abuse. I'm talking about anybody that claims the idea of victimhood. If one lingers in that mindset for life, it, it degrades one's mental health. 
if one takes the active step of, I desire to overcome, it will improve one's mental health. Now, it's not up to me to tell you what your timeline is for recovery. And it's not up to you to tell me. So we don't get to look at each other and say, chop, chop. You got to be a, a victim yesterday, but now it's time to move into survivor mode. And then tomorrow you better be at victor. We don't get to say that. What I'm simply suggesting is there ought to be an expectation that I am not forever broken. And this is not an identity badge that I will wear for the rest of my life. This has happened to me. And through help and healing and through the power of God, I will overcome this. Let's talk about offenders. And I think a really important part of this conversation is enablers. Now, I've got five things uh, that we're going to talk about in this. That's going down? I thought I was going up. Oh, man. My time is just getting away from me. Uh, we'll see what happens in this section. I may have to just skip over a whole lot. Bill Anderson writes in a book called When, Child, or when, when Abuse Comes to Church, A persistent myth is that of the dirty old man, a stranger who lurks in parks to prey upon unsuspecting children. In reality, 90 to 95% of sexually abused children are victimized by a family member or by someone they know and trust. In one study, half of abusers were under the age of 31. Only 10% were over 50. Don't let Hollywood tell you what this sin ought to look like. Because this sin looks a lot different in reality. And the vast majority of the time, it looks like somebody who is known to the victim. We'll skip that for time. Um, okay, all right. You heard it. I got 45 minutes. Dr. Jean Abel and colleagues conducted a study on sexual offenders in the late 1980s, and they asked voluntary sex offenders, or rather, excuse me, sex offenders, a voluntary, uh, in, I don't even know how to explain this. They asked sex offenders who were in prison to voluntarily talk about the total offenses they'd committed. The study guaranteed confidentiality from further prosecution. So in study one, they interviewed 232 child molesters, and what they learned was that there was 55,000 attempts of molestation, 38,000 of them were successful on 17,000 victims, which signifies on average 73 victims for abuser. In another study, they, uh, they uh, were able to interact with 561 sexual offenders, 291,000 different types of offenses were tried on 195,000 victims, which signifies 348 victims per offender. I share this data with you because despite these staggering figures, most will never get detected. And in fact, the computed chances of being caught for the sexual offense were 3%. So when we say things like, but this can't happen in the church, right? Surely we don't have these issues, right? Or it happened that one time, right? It's not that bad, right? What the data is suggesting to us is that there's a lot more happening behind the scenes that we're not familiar with. But that can't happen in the church, right? And yet the scriptures teach us, like in Jude 1.4, there are certain people who crept in unnoticed. These people pervert the grace of our God into sensuality. Jesus calls false prophets ravenous wolves. In Matthew 23, the Pharisees are called full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. And you might say, but you know, in context, that's about false teachers or that's about uh, religious leaders. And what I'm suggesting to you is that part of the way that these false teachers do what they do is by telling you they're doing what is right while they're living out what is wrong. That is a perversion of the grace of God into sensuality. Sexual predators are ravenous wolves because they prey on the helpless. They're deceptive in their operation and they manipulate God's grace and they manipulate God's people. That's predatory. Why are we so frequently shocked when we hear that good brother so-and-so really led a double life? And the answer is we're shocked because we're dealing with deception. And we don't think we ought to be dealing with deception. When we get here on Sunday, we think we ought to be dealing with the communion or with worship. And when we don't have to worry about deception here. We worry, we worry about that out there. And so when someone is deceitful in here, it's shocking. Dr. Salter says private behavior cannot be predicted from public behavior. 
Kind, nonviolent individuals behave well in pub public, but so do many people who are brutal behind the scenes. The lives predators lead in public may be exemplary, almost surreal in their rectitude. Now, the Bible advocates for this view. 2 Timothy 3.13 Indeed, all who desire to live godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while evil people and impostors will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. They count it pleasure to revel in the daytime. They are blots and blemishes, revealing in their reveling in their deception while they feast with you. If it were only the ones who were active in the deceit, and all we had to do was protect our loved ones from those that were actively trying to take advantage of them, that would be one thing. But another part of the conversation that has to be had, and, and we have to put this into quantifiable terms, are those who would enable. Both Christian advocates of those that are caught in this form of abuse and, and secular research in the field of child sex abuse and domestic violence are in agreement that churches, sadly, are far more likely to be a safe haven for abusers than for their victims. And so there is a long, sad history in what I'm going to call Christendom, Bible or, or Jesus-believing groups, whatever you want to say. There's a long history in religious communities of enabling behavior. But you know what? There's nothing new under the sun. There were enablers in Bible times just as there are now. When I look at 2 Samuel 13, at the tragedy of Tamar, do you remember what we said about the king? When King David heard all of these things, he was very angry. And this is my inference, but he didn't do anything. What he ought to have done, he ought to have exercised justice. Deuteronomy 22, verse 13 through 29, Amnon deserved the death penalty. He got nothing. And by him getting nothing... David enabled uh, not only him to think he could be above the law, it enables Absalom to take the law into his own hands and murder his brother. It enables uh, an entire nation to fall apart and crumble. Well, what's an enabler? Keep using that word. An enabler in context, uh, whether positive or negative, is somebody who simply encourages or empowers someone towards a goal. So it can be a good thing. We ought to enable one another towards love and good works. We ought not to enable one another towards some sort of dysfunctional behavior. And what I'd like to do is first show you a scripture, and then I want to show you eight different ways that people think they're being helpful, but they're really enabling bad behavior. What's interesting about this list is that it wasn't necessarily compiled by me, but I have experienced each item on this list recently by those that thought they were being helpful. And all they did really was validate to me that this data is valid. So Proverbs 29, 20, uh, 27 says, an unjust man is an abomination to the righteous, but one whose way is straight is an abomination to the wicked. That's a tough verse. But those, as we're going to talk about, who enable can't stand what is right. They're motivated sometimes by a desire to protect the offender. Oh, he's such a nice man. Have you heard of all the good that he's doing? Why would we uh, blow up his ministry? Well, that's the second one. Motivated by self-preservation. We don't want to hurt the ministry. We don't want to hurt the collection. We don't want to hurt our church attendance. We don't want to hurt our reputation in the brotherhood. Number three. Motivated by a misguided desire to help. Well, why didn't you, why didn't you scream out? Why didn't you tell me sooner? Why did you wear that? Motivated by faulty reasoning. You really want to blow up the church over this? You, you, you who want to sound the alarm, you want to make this worse? Motivated by fear and shame. There's, there's no way it could happen here. I know these people. There's no way. Motivated by indifference and apathy. Doesn't affect me. My plate is full. I've got too much. It's not my problem. 
motivated by an aversion to evil. It's too disturbing to think about. I don't even talk. We don't talk about that. It's shameful. We don't talk about it. Number eight, motivated by ignorance. These people are going after him because they're just jealous. So they're going to try to tear him down in any way they can because they're just jealous of him. Proverbs 17, 15 says, He who justifies the wicked and he who condemns the just, both of them alike, are an abomination to the Lord. To anybody in this audience and listening on YouTube as well, if you used any of those eight tactics to try to mask or hide or cover up evil behavior under the sake of, or under the guise of doing greater good, let's, let's cover this up so that greater good can happen. You're wrong. Repent. Change before it's too late. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. What are we supposed to do? You read about this list of enablers, you read about this list of offenders, and maybe it's working you up, right? Well, first, I don't want to sensationalize this where we all go get our pitchforks and torches and we start interviewing every member one by one under a single light and asking, where were you on the night of the 15th, right? That's not what I'm interested in. But what we are interested in is proper response both to the offender and the enabler. As has been read a few times today, Ephesians 5, 11 says, Have no fellowship with unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. For it's shameful to even speak of those things that which are done by them in secret. We have three things that we ought to do. I can talk to you more about it in the Q&A. So I'm just going to make a, a summary statement for each one. First, we must oppose and expose right? I know it rhymes. I did it for a reason. Oppose and expose. That's a very easy thing to remember. That's our job. Oppose and expose. We advocate for biblical forgiveness. As we talked about earlier today, to forgive is not to forget. To forgive is not to relieve one from their legal obligation or consequence. We forgive biblically. But we also advocate for biblical mercy and grace and love, not a kind of grace and mercy and love that, that tries to sweep an issue under the rug and say things like, well, let's just love them back into the Lord. Well, let's just be gracious because, you know, none of us is perfect, right? When it comes to this, this level of deviancy, that's not merciful, it's not gracious, and it's not loving. And let's take the lens off of the offender and let's put it on the oppressed, which is where the Bible has put it. And we're called to defend, to uplift and support and to help. And so as was mentioned this morning as well, I will say it again, what's the foundation of God's throne? If you weren't here, you might think it is love and you might think it is grace and you might think it's faith and you might think it's hope. But Psalm 89 verse 14 says, righteousness and justice are are the foundation of your throne. Steadfast love and faithfulness go before you. You cannot love someone if it is unrighteous and if there is no justice. That's not love. Notice what happens when righteousness and justice are the foundation. Steadfast love and faithfulness flow out from it. It's natural, outpouring, immense. A waterfall. Just imagine with me when God's throne in a church is firmly established in righteousness and justice, love flows. It's a desert whenever righteousness and justice are not present. Well, how do we bring someone back? This is the last slide on this section before we move into the next. How do we bring someone back? That's where the conversation often goes. And I will say this many times. We need to get the lens off of the offender and on to the one who has been oppressed, and we need to help them. However, I know my, my mind goes this way, and I know yours does as well, so how do we bring someone back from this sin? If he makes a true confession, and a true confession is not, I said some things and I've done some things. A true confession is a willingness to declare what one has done, he must bear fruits that are worthy of repentance. And if any of you are a hobby gardener like me, 
You know that when you want fruits, you start the work months beforehand. It's time to remove the rocks. It's time to remove the weeds. It's time to plant the seeds and water and keep the pesky squirrels away. You got to get rid of that stuff before fruits can ever come. You have to, or he must rather, accept the consequences, the legal consequences of his sin. He must labor to make restitution where he is able to make restitution. He must understand that restoration is not a reset to the way things were in the same way. I, I, I tend to believe this is true. I hope it is. In the same way, if the church treasurer was caught embezzling the church funds and lost everything, and the building was foreclosed, and even the songbooks got repoed. In the same way, if the next Sunday he says, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to, go ahead and give me the checkbook and I'll make it right. He doesn't get a reset, and nor does somebody caught in this sin. We can talk more about that in the Q&A as well. I really want to talk about this, reporting sexual abuse. So we'll divided into three categories, establishing the precedent of why we ought to report, uh, the signs of the need to report so that if you are a person who is a mandated reporter that you can uh, be aware of, of what potentially could happen, and then actually making a report yourself. You need to know this, if you either witness or suspect sexual abuse, or if you've been sexually abused, you need to call the police immediately. Six months ago, when I gave a 20-minute version of this at Sulphur, that sentence made my knees knock. I wasn't sure how people would react to it. I really thought maybe I was going to get called down or that afterwards the preacher would get up and say, well, that's not biblical. Thankfully, in that uh, meeting, there was good reaction to it, and I, was, I found encouragement from it, as others have as well. Um, shame on me for being afraid. But you need to know that step one when abuse happens is that we need to contact God's avenging authority. If the abuser is a Christian at the local church or a family member who is a Christian, you still need to call the police. And that's where it gets hard. And that's where I think two questions naturally come up. Number one, well, what if this blows up the family? What if this blows up the church? What if it's so-and-so's dad? What if it's so-and-so's grandpa? Well, we need to know, I mean, absolutely know that sin blows up families, sin blows up the church, and the person who was abused does not blow up the family, they do not blow up the church, and people who hear about this and desire to bring the authorities into the conversation, they did not blow up the family, they did not blow up the church, the abuser did. Amen. Exposing sin, while painful, heals families, and it heals the church, John 3.20 and Ephesians 5.11. Of course we understand that with the wound analogy. You have a deep wound that hasn't been cleaned out, expecting that a Band-Aid is somehow going to take care of the gangrene festering within? No. You have to rip that Band-Aid off, clean out the filth that's within, and allow the body to heal the best way it can. Well, what about that verse that says not to take brethren to court? 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 1 through 7 is about trivial matters and not about criminal matters. Now, what we might use as an example in modern day settings would be like going on Judge Judy. And maybe you've happened to see that while you're getting your oil changed. That's the only context I know for Judge Judy, by the way. I wouldn't watch it. But Imagine that you're watching this program and uh, two people go on Judge Judy and it says, this is Brother So-and-So and Brother So-and-So from the, the First Street Church of Christ. And they're here to talk about the carburetor on the lawnmower that Brother So-and-So says that Brother So-and-So ruined. And then they proceed to badmouth each other and talk about each other's mother and everything else under the sun. And at the end of it, there's information of where they go to church. That is a trivial matter. And we ought not be engaged with the, the government over these sorts of matters. We ought to be going to each other's home to talk it out. We ought to be meeting at the building with somebody who's safe for both of us to talk it out. Trivial matters don't require government intervention. 
Romans 13, on the other hand, is talking about criminal matters. Verse 4 says, He, that is the governing authority, is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid. If you do wrong, not them, those heathens, but you, believers, if you do wrong, be afraid, for he, that is the governing authority, does not bear the sword in vain, for he is God's, or he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. What I'd like to do is show you in my state just what the implications are for somebody who would decide I'm not going to obey Romans chapter 13. Now, you can go to the website, and this is just a screenshot. You're not intended to be able to read it. It's just a visual aid. But you can Google uh, any sort of law in your state, and there will be pages upon pages upon pages of code. And what these pages will tell us is that we ought to obey the laws of the land. And you need to know that in Texas, Family Code section 22.011 states it is a criminal offense to sexually abuse a child. It's a criminal offense. This isn't a trivial matter in the eyes of the state of Texas. And I imagine that that every state has different verbiage, or maybe there's some subtle differences, but most states are probably going to more or less say the same thing. It is also important to know that the family code says that if you suspect that a child is being abused or neglected, the law requires you to report it. Does it say in there that you have to be a licensed professional? It doesn't. Because in the state of Texas, if you're a citizen, you're a mandated reporter. And therefore, if you live in my state and you say, we don't take brethren to court, you break this law. Failure to report suspected child abuse and neglect is a criminal offense in the state of Texas. So now you're in an ethical pickle. Which scripture are you going to break? 1 Corinthians 6 or Romans 13? And what we obviously are concluding is you don't have to break either. Because when it comes to trivial matters, you don't take those to the government. But when it comes to criminal matters, you are required to take them to the government. Let's talk about the signs of the need to report. This is the hardest section for me to talk about. I kind of glance over it very quickly. There's a lot of information in the appendices of that article over there. By the way, I've got 30 copies. And if you want to take that, there's a lot of information, but really what I'm also interested in is I want you and your red pen to review it, help me understand the places where maybe my logic isn't consistent, where there are other things that could be worked on. I'd like to make something better and turn it into a a handbook that I could actually share with churches. Dr. Anna Salter says, malevolence takes a bite out of your spirit, just sitting with it, just talking with people who consciously and deliberately exploit others feels like being bitten. It absolutely does. And so it does when you talk with those who've been abused. Your soul has been bitten. And you can read a lot more about the physical, behavioral, and emotional symptoms of abuse in Appendix A and B of that article. But I would caution you, it is very graphic and it is very difficult to read. But what I wouldn't caution you is not to read it. You need to. And if you live in the state of Texas, you better know what it looks like because you have to report it. As you prepare to report, there are four reminders that I want to share with you about disclosure. Number one, it's not your job to investigate, it's your job to report. In an effort to minimize PR damage, some will insist that before going to the police, we ought to first determine whether or not the story is credible, whether or not it's true. That might seem reasonable, but it's actually an avoidance tactic, and it's not your job to investigate. Now, I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist in the state of Texas. I'm a mandated reporter based on my ethical guidelines, and so I receive specific training about how to report. Do you want to know what my specific training was? Here, I'm going to tell you. It's not my job as a therapist to investigate. It's my job to report. If somebody comes into my office, and whether as a family or a couple or as an individual, when they're talking to me, if abuse is disclosed, I don't get to pause and say, now hold on, let's talk about what you just said and and, uh, let's parse it out. 
It's my job to report what was said, and so it is with you. I want you to remember that. Number two, you need to encourage parents who suspect their child of, that has been abused sexually to schedule a medical exam for the child and an evaluation by a counselor who specializes in abuse. And it's urgent. This can't afford to wait. If there's a suspicion, please do this sooner rather than later. Number three, this reminder is that professional medical and mental health clinicians can handle the heavy emotionalism that surrounds child sex sexual abuse objectively, while a family member may struggle to cope with it. Part of the discussion around this is the question, what happened to you? It's a loaded question for somebody who's been sexually abused, especially, and sadly, coming from an authority figure whom they ought to love. But because they're very confused and they're in a place of a lot of pain, for you to ask the question, what happened to you? And for your responses to be uh, very visual about maybe the disgust you have or the nausea that you feel, uh, what is suggested in the literature is bring in somebody who won't have those emotional types of responses. I didn't get to develop this one very much, but I feel like it's an important thing to remind you about when you're prepared to discuss or to disclose abuse, I think it's just relevant to know that you may walk a lonely road and people may turn their back on you. Friends may turn their back on you. Family may turn their back on you because they think you're part of the problem of blowing up the church or of blowing up the family. However, let's talk very briefly, very briefly, about making a report, just to visually show you what to do. If I went to Google and I, I search how to report abuse, uh, where I am, it, the first thing that comes up is the Texas Department of Family and Protective Services. And if I were to zoom in on that, which I can't, the very middle of that page would have a phone number and a hyperlink, and so I could either call or I could report online. And once TDFPS has this information, they will then begin the investigation. If the report is deemed uncredible by the authorities, they will let you know, either by email or by standard mail. If they deem it credible, there's a lot of different things that could happen. If it requires them to make a wellness check and put the fear of God into the family, then that might be what they do. If the threat is deemed immediate, they may remove the child from that family. I have had to file both CPS, Child Protective Services, and APS, Adult Protective Service, claims against clients. And so based on what was revealed to me in the room, I then had to leave the room and contact the authorities. I can tell you, it is a nauseating experience. It's nauseating to make the call. It's nauseating to have to talk to the CPS officer. It's nauseating whenever the report comes back. And for some reason, it's nauseating whenever they validate your findings. You hope against hope. I don't know why it is this way, but you hope against hope that maybe you just got it wrong. And you say, please God, maybe I just overreacted. And that's my prayer in those times. And yet when it comes back that there was enough evidence to pursue, you feel sick to your stomach. But I feel like I've said this phrase about a hundred times in this study. I try not to have a tick like this, but I'm pretty anxious and so I have a tick. I'm gonna go ahead and tell it to you. Maybe that'll speak it out of me. I keep saying the phrase, you need to know. But you need to know this whatever nauseous feeling you might have about reporting it is nothing compared to the nightmare of the person who endured it. It's not about you. You have the power and the ability to help. And it might make you feel sick, but this is a very real application of this scripture. Learn to do good, seek justice, correct oppression, bring justice to the fatherless, plead the widow's cause. Now let's briefly mention prevention and healing because this starts to get into what if scenarios and, and those are challenging to talk about because sometimes you just don't know until you have to walk that road. But I'll do my best to maybe share some information about prevention and some uh, information about healing. So we'll talk about preventing it before it happens, after it happens, and then very, very briefly about active listening and then counseling and supporting groups. If we want to prevent abuse before it happens, 
First, we must admit that it could happen. Congregations in their business meetings, from time to time, families ought to have discussions about it could happen here. We don't look at each other as though everybody's a predator, but we, we admit that it could happen. Number two, we must create and respect clear boundaries. Here's the example that I'd like to give you. I'm a preacher. I'm a therapist, right? So there are, there are certain amounts of respect and power that, that those roles have. And so I might get to move a little freely in the congregation and, and wield that power, right? And so maybe uh, I got a really busy schedule and this person says they want to study the Bible with me and it's really inconvenient to go all the way out to their house. They don't have the internet, so we're going to meet the building. That works for me. But maybe this young person, their parents catch wind that... Uh, they're going to meet me at the building for a Bible study, and they say, no, that, that doesn't work for us. I ought to respond with, okay, instead of, well, I'm one of the good guys, and, and you should trust me. I'm on your side. Boundaries work two ways. And for those of us who are in positions of leadership and authority, when families ask us to respect their boundaries, we ought to comply. Number three, I really believe these, by the way. This is not just some list that I think is fluff in the sermon. I believe that congregations ought to create small, private groups of volunteers who are willing to be educated and trained as advocates for sexual abuse victims. There's a lot of training material out there, a lot of great stuff out there. And I think it ought to have men in that group, and I think it ought to have women in that group, as a male therapist, one of the most challenging things is when female victims have to disclose sexual abuse to me. I don't make the rules of who gets along with who, but the pattern that I see is a lot of times it's very difficult if a female is abused by a male to then sit with the male and talk about that abuse. So we need our sisters to be involved in these small groups. I also believe we need to have times in our public assembly where we regularly notify our members about the church's view on protecting the helpless and who they can talk to. It could go something like this. This is our worship. Thank you, everybody, for coming out. And just like we always do, about once a month, we want to let everybody know that this ought to be a safe place for you. And if it's your first time with us, then we want you to know that we believe that it is our job to defend those who can't defend themselves. And if something's happened to you that you need help with, and we are talking about emotional or physical or sexual abuse, then we would be willing to advocate on your behalf. Uh, sister so-and-so, sister so-and-so, brother so-and-so, would y'all raise your hands real quick? These are our, our volunteers. You can talk to them. They're trained in this. You can also talk to me, and I'll put you in their direction. So that's an example of how such a closing announcement might go. After abuse has happened, obviously, if we want to prevent it, then we're going to report abuse and we're going to expose darkness. Part of the foundation of this will be that we prioritize the recovery and the rehabilitation of the helpless. Instead of getting bogged down in arguments over how do we help the offender, and we ought to do this for him and we have to accept this, the conversation ought to be how are we helping those who can't help themselves? And once we've established that, then we talk about the offender. What do we do whenever somebody wants to come back to church after this sort of egregious sin has taken place? Well, there are three different ways that I have in the uh, information there, and I'll just briefly summarize them for you. Number one, a church can say, you are no longer welcome here. Please do not come back. Number two, a church can welcome that person back on some very clear boundaries you will never interact with anybody who is under the age of 18. You will interact with these people. They will sit next to you during the worship. If you stay for any sort of extracurricular event, like a lunch, you will be sitting with these people. We will be notifying the congregation about what has happened. Or if both of these options seem terrible to you and you feel that you absolutely have to bring this person back, restore it into the fold 100% the way it was before, I implore you at the very least Tell the families in your congregation so they can make a decision for themselves. Do not hide this.
parents deserve the right to make a decision for themselves over whether or not they want to be around someone who statistically is likely to have a very deep-seated issue. And if they're not getting help for that issue, then that issue could strike again. Well, we could talk for over 15 minutes about active listening and counseling support groups. I would simply share that when a survivor or a victor is ready to disclose to you, and especially if you don't have any experience with this sort of conversation, just know what an honor it is that you were safe enough, that they felt open enough to come and bring that to you. And instead of spending all of your time going from A to B, here's how I'm going to solve it, here's how you're going to feel better, and uh, high five, now let's get out of here. Instead of that approach, by simply taking time to listen, to hear their story, and to make them feel like this is a legitimate issue, is an amazing step towards recovery. Counseling and supporting groups, I can't say enough about how I believe that uh, we ought to be involved in those as well, but for the sake of time, I won't. Let's wrap it up, shall we? Let's talk about the mandate, and then I'll be done. This afternoon, somebody came up to me and said, I don't know if I'm going to get to be there, so could you summarize it for me in, in one sentence? And I thought, I don't think I could do that, but I'll try. And then I failed. We ended up talking for over five minutes, and I could tell by his shifty eyes that I was saying too much. But I will try in just a, a minute to summarize what we've talked about here. And I've chosen to summarize it with Nehemiah. In an issue unrelated to sex abuse. But I think the scripture will help show the mandate. Nehemiah chapter 1 verse 4. So it was when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned for many days. I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. What I like about that picture is you see Nehemiah weeping, but you also see him on fire. And that book, more than maybe any other book on leadership and on one's galvanized convictions to accomplish a work show us that when you recognize the need, you can both weep over the tragedy and then you get to work. Jimmy Hinton, who had to advocate for the abused by taking his father to prison for sexual abuse, struggled with this man who for his whole life had been such a great example and uh, had done everything right with him. Jimmy's faith was built on this man and then suddenly this man was not who he thought he was and everything that Jimmy Hinton believed in seemed to be washing away and he found himself asking the question, where were you God? I think that question gets asked a lot in this context. Where were you God? And what I hope that the Bible's mandate can teach us is this. As I was crying out, where were you, God? The answer, came, the answer that came was, where were my people? God is our shield and protector, but we are also created in His image. As image bearers, we are charged to mirror Christ and to be the protectors of the innocent ourselves. Thank you.